Hi, this is Dr. Max Fung, University of California, Davis in Sacramento, California. We'll be finishing off our introductory derm path series covering special stains and patterns of inflammatory skin disease. So first, in order to stain and properly evaluate tissue, the tissue needs to be properly preserved or fixed. And the vast majority of our skin specimens are placed in formalin and are then paraffin embedded, so-called FFPE, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So what is this formalin that we're putting all of these little pieces of skin into? If you wanna answer this question, please pause and look at the choices. For the dermatopathologist in training, the correct answer is A, 37 to 40% formaldehyde. And if you look at the label on the specimen bottles that you're using, it usually says 10% neutral buffered formalin. So the formalin is diluted down further to a 10% neutral buffered solution. Notice also the biohazard warnings on the specimen bottle label and the hazard bag. So this is a carcinogen and it's uh, regulated strictly in the laboratory. Uh, I think Federal Occupation Safety and Health Administration, Federal OSHA, uh, allows no more than an exposure of one part uh, per million over an eight hour shift. You may have been wondering, and I will now confirm, that there actually is some element of truth to all of the answers that were listed. So actually, as far as I know, uh, choice D is also correct. Uh, but I'm definitely not an expert in that area. So beyond the um, uh, online reference, I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. Um, and it turns out that um, formaldehyde is chemically derived from methanol. Uh, and then uh, there's this uh, methanol actually is this uh, systematic chemical name for formaldehyde. So methanol and formaldehyde are the same. However, these are naturally occurring, so it's not synthetic. An ideal fixative like 10% NBF has a winning combination of desirable, desirable properties. It's antibacterial, facilitates dye adhesion, and also enhances optical resolution in that it um, enhances the differences in the refractive indices between different tissue compartments. Like many great discoveries in science and medicine, tissue staining was discovered accidentally Legend has it that von Gerlach in 1858 left a piece of cerebellar tissue uh, in a dilute carmine solution overnight and was pleasantly surprised by what could be visualized the next day. I would have to assume that in the 1860s, the field of histochemistry was pretty hot. Within a decade, we had the discovery of hematoxylin followed by the synthesis of the sodium potassium salt of tetrabromofluorescine, also known as eosin, and in 1876, the use of the hematoxylin and eosin double stain. So eosin is synthetic, whereas hematoxylin is a naturally occurring substance. It's derived from the, uh, the heartwood, or the dead but desirable central portion of the logwood tree, hematoxylin cantechianum. Did you know that San Francisco is one of the world's great shipping and export centers for hematoxylin? If you recognized the Embarcadero but wondered where, where's the ferry terminal or Alcatraz? Well, you'd be right. This is San Francisco de Campeche in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And while I'd be willing to bet that many of you have been to Cancun or Cozumel on the eastern side of the peninsula, Campeche is on the left side. So as a naturally occurring product, hematoxylin is subject to market forces of supply and demand, which have been issues for supplies to laboratories in the past. And the industry itself can be a great economic boon, but also poses deforestation issues. Other sources include Jamaica, Belize, Haiti, Mexico, and hematoxylin has been used for other purposes as a dye for clothing fabrics and uh, I've been told also as a coloring for wine, uh, but, but surely not for our fine beloved California wines. Suffice it to say, the H&E double stain has been a winning one-two punch combination for about a century and a half now and, and still going strong. Hematoxylin is a positively charged cationic base base-loving or basophilic dye that is a great nuclear stain because it binds the negatively charged phosphate groups in nucleic acid, DNA, 
Eosin is a negatively charged, acid-loving or acidophilic dye that differentially binds most other structures in the relatively acidic cytoplasm of cells. And with that, we're back somewhat full circle to the previous session on common skin disorders where we reviewed basic histology in order to start to be able to interpret abnormalities in inflammatory and neoplastic skin diseases. So after h &E, what's the second most popular histochemical stain in derm path? I don't know for sure, but I strongly suspect that it is the PAS stain. Not only is it a workhorse for identifying dermatophytes and superficial fungi such as Malassezia or Candida species, but also going to identify some bacteria as well as other structures, including the cytoplasm of neutrophils and also non-specifically fibrin and crust. PAS also stains neutral pH mucopolysaccharides or mucins. These are different from the stromal mucins, like when, you, when we look for increased mucin in lupus, for example. These are the epithelial or glandular mucins, and they're, they're seen in sweat glands and also basement membranes along the dermal epidermal junction and other basement membranes. And the staining color is the same. It's kind of a magenta pink color. We can sometimes use the PAS stain to facilitate diagnosis as well. Uh, senior residents, please pause and respond. So a basement membrane thickening is a feature of certain disorders. Discoid lupus is probably best known, but also porphyrias, lichen sclerosis, and uh, some tumors as well, trichelomoma and cylindroma. And this thickening can be highlighted by the PAS stain. There are two variants to the PAS stain, PAS and PASD. This last step is a diastase, an enzyme that for our purposes removes glycogen from the cytoplasm of epithelial cells. On h &E, these cells appear pale and clear, so I find that this is rarely needed in practice, but it's uh, nice to know that you can demonstrate the presence of cytoplasmic glycogen by doing a combined PAS and PASD stain and comparing them. The glycogen will be highlighted on the PAS, but will be removed on the PASD. Quick note on pronunciation. This is the per iodic acid shift. So I usually say PAS, but I'm sure I've said periodic acid shift in the past, uh, but this is not like your periodic trips to a day spa or the periodic table of elements. This is the per iodic, so like hydrogen peroxide and iodinated. If you're like me and you like listening to rap music sometimes, then you can think of the PAS and the PASD stain as, as cool stains. Rap star cool. Just, just call them the PAS or the PASD. So here's our PAS stain and we can see it staining some nonspecific crust in the parakeratosis on the upper left, but more specific is the cytoplasmic positivity shown on the right. And now we have the PASD. Note that the nonspecific crust on the upper left is still there, but the glycogen in the spinous layer is no longer seen. I think most of us should be familiar with gram stains for bacteria. Uh, you might recall if you did these manually as a medical student that it can be somewhat subjective and subject to technical factors, whether the organisms appear gram-positive or gram-negative. But we can usually tell if cocci or bacilli are present. So do you see the bacteria in this image in the black square? What's your diagnosis? They're cocci, but notice how they're kind of sitting on collagen fibers, a little bit out of the plane of the tissue section. Uh, whereas a true infection such as cellulitis or necrotizing fasciitis would have more of a diffuse uh, infiltrate of pathogens not just sitting directly on collagen fibers. So this is, unfortunately it seems like sometimes it's the most commonly encountered organisms, but this is just technical artifact and it's important obviously to avoid overcalling infection when it's not there. The meson trichrome helps to distinguish collagen fibers from muscle fibers, as may be encountered in the dermis. Conveniently, collagen is blue-green and muscle fibers, somewhat intuitively, stain red. Uh, in practice, I find that I order this stain probably about once every five years, and when I do, it's usually just for teaching purposes.
we talked about the PAS stain for epithelial glandular mucins. The stromal mucins or acidic pH mucins are highlighted by different stains. These are the colloidal iron, toluidine blue, alcyon blue. Uh, however, this is another stain that I probably only order once a year at the most. Um, I find that H&E usually suffices, at least at the level of diagnostic dermatopathology. Uh, interstitial mucin has a distinctive appearance. It's kind of pale, uh, blue, gray, lavender, kind of this delicate cobweb appearance. Uh, often the same color as elastotic fibers, but uh, with a different pattern and often extending into the deep dermis. A stain for elastic tissue, I do indeed order probably several times per year. This is the VVG or EVG stain, and it's considered to be a, a regressive stain in that the elastic tissue has a high affinity for ferric chloride, which resists de-staining. Uh, as a silver stain, the reaction product is black. And this is more useful, I find, because we, unless it's solar elastosis, you cannot see the elastic fibers on H&E. The GMS stain is another silver-based stain, and this is one of the uh, top two fungal stains that we use along with the PAS. And in both cases, the uh, stains target the wall of the organism, the polysaccharides in the wall of the fungus. The acid fast stains highlight mycobacteria, so-called red snappers, and there's different variants. We tend to use the uh, fight stain most often. Uh, it helps to pick up leprosy or M. marinum, and we tend not to see tuberculosis very often in the skin in our practice. Historically, treponemal infections were identified using silver-based stains, but these, as long as I've been practicing, had a, had a reputation for being uh, difficult to perform and interpret, kind of kind of messy looking silver stains, if you will. And as shown in the upper right, this is also a good stain for granuloma inguinale, showing uh, Donovan bodies containing Klebsiella granulomatis. We're mostly seeing syphilis these days in our parts, so um, we're predominantly using the treponema pallidum immuno stain. The von Kossa stain for calcium is another silver-based stain. And this is a stain that I, I hardly ever order as well. Usually calcium is readily apparent on H&E, and so um, a von Kossa stain is not needed. The one exception where I've started to uh, think about doing von Kossa and finding it helpful occasionally is in the identification of very subtle calcification, which is a common uh, feature one is searching for when we're trying to rule out calciphylaxis. So subtle uh, capillary or periecrine calcification may be revealed with a von Kossa stain when it's not readily seen on H&E. The Fontana Masson stain for melanin is also a stain that I hardly ever order. Uh, melanin is usually readily apparent on H&E stains. Uh, probably the one situation where I order it regularly is when I'm trying to rule out vitiligo and distinguish it from post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. Then I'm looking for minimal residual melanin, and that Fontana Masson stain can help me make a definitive assessment on whether any minimal residual epidermal melanin is present or not. Sometimes melanin is too prominent and it obscures the cytologic interpretation, so one can do a bleaching step to remove melanin. The other pigment that is brownish in color and can sometimes be confused with melanin is hemosiderin, also present in the upper dermis in things like pigmented purpura or venous stasis. Uh, so pearls, Prussian blue, hemosiderin, they're all pretty much equivalent. We just call it the hemosiderin stain. Usually the distinction can be made on H&E, but if there's any doubt or if there's a question that both might be present, uh, also some forms of uh, drug induced pigmentation, such as minocycline pigmentation, may show both components, both melanin and um, hemosiderin, so the stain can be helpful there. And just a word of caution for uh, attempts to confirm the presence of hemorrhage in nail specimens. The pearl stain will not work in the anaerobic environment of the nail. The different pigment forms called hematoidin and uh, the pearl stain will not work. There is something called a benzidine stain that can be done to identify hemoglobin, 
but um, it's not widely available. Uh, apparently, the chemicals that uh, are involved in the procedure are somewhat toxic, and um, so not not available. Although I do remember uh, when I was a resident, Phil Lebois reached out to a component a colleague in Europe uh, to obtain the stain for us in a case that we later published. Congo Red is the main stain that we use for amyloid, and the buzzword or the buzz phrase is apple green. So if you hear that phrase, think Congo Red amyloid. And so under polarized light, the positive stain will have a more or less apple green appearance, although that can be somewhat subjective. Uh, there are other stains for amyloid, although we don't use them in our lab. Um, so H&E usually sufficient for cutaneous amyloid. So macular amyloid, lichen amyloid, generally not worth getting a Congo red stain. I usually just make the call on H&E. Now with the systemic amyloid, that's a different ball of wax. So um, after a confirmatory Congo red stain, we will typically go to an ancillary diagnostic method. Uh, electron microscopy was the kind of the historical gold standard, which is not being uh, done very often, not widely available. So mass spectrometry is the method that we've been going to to a send out reference lab. And here's the Congo red positive red stain and under polarized light we see some things that you might say yeah kind of looks a little apple green. I mean I feel like I've seen this sometimes in just regular collagen fibers but you know this is this is pretty much it. This is what you get. Here's the Congo red stain on a case of macular amyloid and you can see some weak staining in the upper dermis but it's not um, you know, it's one of those situations where it's nice if you have it, but if it's not really staining well or if it's negative, I'm not going to say it's not macular amyloid. It's pretty much an H&E call. Scarlet red is, is much better, maybe almost too much. Frozen or absolute ethanol fixed tissue is required to appreciate the highly birefringent crystals in gout. Uh, typically what we receive are formalin fixed specimens and even though the crystals have been washed away and birefringence is no longer present, uh, the H&E appearances are distinctive. Mast cells are usually readily identified on H&E. In the dermis, they tend to have a more or less round or oval uh, shape with a centrally situated small round nucleus and pale granular cytoplasm. Uh, comparison with the uh, fried egg is very common. And when needed, we can do uh, Gimza or toluidine blue histochemical stains or immunostains for CD117 or mast cell tryptase. When I was a resident, it seemed that it was important to know which stains were regressive stains, like the EVG stain, and also which stains were metachromatic. So the Gimza is a metachromatic stain, as is the toluidine blue. Uh, and in these metachromatic stains, the reaction product is a different color from the stain. So if you happen to have a bottle of Gimza in front of you, you'd see that it's more of a, a blue color, uh, yet it stains the mast cell granules purple. Similar situation with the toluidine blue. So let's take a look at immunohistochemical stains now. We just finished looking at a variety of histochemical stains. Those are all distinct chemical reactions wherein the reaction product dep depends on the nature of the chemical interaction, which is different for the different stains. With IHC, it's more of a stereotypical reaction and it's highly specific. So if you look at the definition above, it's the microscopic localization of specific antigens in tissue by staining with specific antibodies labeled with fluorescent or pigmented material. And in this newer definition, they talk about more specifically fluorescent dyes or uh, horseradish peroxidase. And so the point here is that there are specific antibodies and the reaction that you see depends on the detection system. So you can use a fluorescent detection system or uh, enzymes that create reaction products that are a certain color that you expect to see every time. IHC has revolutionized the ability of pathologists to identify cell lineage and differentiation and uh, also particularly for hematolymphoid infiltrates, the immunophenotype of the tumor cell. A question that continues to come up from time to time as recently as 2020 
is whether formalin fixation is sufficient and whether additional tissue needs to be set aside to evaluate tumors, particularly lymphoid tumors. And I've been telling my colleagues for many years now that uh, fresh tissue is essentially never required in the initial evaluation of a lymphoid infiltrate, that formalin fixed paraffin and embedded is okay. Uh, we were graced with an amazing lecture from a true world expert in hematopathology and immunohistochemistry, Dr. Lawrence Weiss, recently. And so um, I was happy to see that he pretty much confirmed uh, that advice that I've been giving colleagues. But he does talk about some situations, some rare situations, where um, the paraffin sections may be lacking in their ability to deliver. So check, check, check. However, a main limitation of immunohistochemistry is that it usually does not distinguish benign from malignant tumors, with few exceptions that we'll mention. So as noted in the definition of immunohistochemistry, one method is using fluorescence to identify the antigen of interest. So one can use a fluorophore such as fluorescein and um, the common application in DermPath is DIF, direct immunofluorescence testing for certain disorders, immunobullous disorders and other things. And um, this is an exception to the formal and fixed rule. So definitely do not place your biopsy for DIF testing in formalin. Instead, it must be placed in a separate bottle containing an ammonium sulfate solution. We call it Michel's media. It's also known as Zeus transport media, but this will preserve the antibodies bound to the tissue uh, and also hold the specimen stable for at least a few days so that it can be um, cryopreserved for the direct immunofluorescence test where we take fluorescein conjugated antibodies and apply it directly to the tissue. Uh, if you happen to be right next door to the lab, it can be just transported fresh as well. It doesn't need to be placed in transport media unless it's going to be transferred you know, for more than an hour or so. DIF testing is usually performed in a panel of about six stains. So IgG, IgM, IgA, C3, fibrinogen, and we use albumin essentially as a negative control. And the DIF testing is essential for the diagnosis of immunobullous disorders. It's considered the gold standard. So pemphigoid, pemphigus, dermatitis, or pediformis, things like that. Uh, it also is critical in establishing a diagnosis of IgA vasculitis. And in my experience, in descending order of importance, it can also be helpful to support a diagnosis of lichen planus and occasionally, but least commonly, lupus or porphyria. However, the vast majority of the immunohistochemistry that is performed is by the enzyme-based method, so-called so -called chromogenic immunohistochemistry, and the immunoperoxidase is by far the most uh, established method. So this is the one where it's okay to put the tissue in formalin, and almost every test that we would need to do, especially for an initial evaluation of a tumor, can be performed on a formalin-fixed specimen using immunoperoxidase methods. And so here we have a primary antibody that's specific for the target, and then a secondary antibody that's linked to a um, uh, enzymes that create a reaction and form a chromogen that has a stereotypic color. So if you use a red chromogen, it'll look like the picture above. But if you use the um, horseradish peroxidase, typically it's more of a, a, a dark brown uh, reaction product. And so the rule with the immunohistochemistry is different from the histochemical stains. The color of the reaction product in IHC is determined by the detection system. So it's always going to look the same color every time, depending on what that detection system is, whether it be enzyme-based, chromogen-based, or fluorescent-based. Now, the localization of the stain can be quite helpful, whether the stain is nuclear or cytoplasmic or membrane or other distinctive patterns, which we'll take a look at for specific examples. So stains for melanocytes are probably among the most frequently ordered. Uh, S100 protein is uh, so named for being 100% soluble in ammonium sulfate. We like to see nuclear and cytoplasmic staining in melanocytes as shown in this intradermal nevus on the upper right hand corner. However, S100 being highly sensitive is unfortunately not highly specific for melanocytes. It also stains neural cells as well as epidermal Langerhans cells and other cells.
So next up are some stains that are relatively more specific for melanocytes, but perhaps not as sensitive. And uh, among these, probably melan A, also known as MART1, is the most frequently used in my experience, but also HMB45, tyrosinase, NKC, NKIC3 can all be used. Uh, these are all cytoplasmic markers, and in particular, HMB45 and melan A are melanosome-based markers. And um, you can see with the immunoperoxidase uh, product that it's very similar in color to the endogenous melanin. It's a little bit brighter here. Look at the endogenous melanin. It has a more uniform distribution. The granules are more uniformly small, perhaps a little bit more truly brown in color. Uh, I think all the cells in the dermis here are, are true positive for, for melan A, which is what this stain is. Now, you can uh, obviate this uh, apparent conundrum by using a red chromatin. Or you can obviate by just not using a cytoplasmic marker. You can use a nuclear stain. And I think overall, these stains have largely supplanted uh, melan A, at least in my practice. Uh, before these stains were available, I was getting melan A somewhat regularly. And then there was a period of time where I ordered melan A and one of these nuclear stains, and now I just ordered the nuclear stain. I think they're both equivalent, MITF and SOX10. And especially within the epidermis, when evaluating um, junctional or in situ lesions, uh, it's essentially 100% specific. There are no other cells in the epidermis that would stain positive. Uh, that's not true, however, for cells in the dermis. In the age of targeted anti-cancer therapy, there are predictive markers for melanoma that are being ordered quite regularly in patients with advanced melanoma. So uh, mutation analysis for BRAF B600E mutations uh, can be approximated using an immunohistochemical stain um, and then also uh, checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1, PD-L1 immunostains are very frequently requested these days. Although the great strides and advancements in treatment of metastatic melanoma is by far the most important accomplishment, perhaps of the last decade, for melanoma patients and their direct providers, I think uh, as diagnostic dermatopathologists, we still personally get a lot more excited uh, with the prospect of diagnostic markers for melanoma, because those have been very few and far between. The st stains I mentioned earlier, S100, melan A, HMB45, um, you know, they all tell you whether something's a melanocyte or not, but they don't really tell you whether something is melanoma or nevus, uh, despite lots of attempts. So sometimes people talk about all oh, the staining pattern in HMB45, but it, it never really has, has gained traction. So a couple of newer markers have gained more traction. I would submit P16 and Prame. Uh, P16 is a little trickier to interpret. We're looking for complete loss of staining. So nevi are positive, whereas melanomas, a subset of them at least, show complete loss of staining. And this would be uh, a surrogate marker for um, biallelic loss or inactivation of the P16 gene, CDKN2A. And for PRAME, this is, uh, stands for preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma. Uh, with PRAME, nevi are negative, but some melanomas, most melanomas, it seems, have diffuse nuclear positivity, the exception being desmoplastic melanoma, where it's not as sensitive. But we'll be discussing these in greater detail in the melanocytic lecture. You all know that there's lots of CD markers. It goes up into the hundreds, I believe. Uh, so let's start with CD1, or more specifically CD1A. This is a marker for Langerhan cells. Uh, it also labels indeterminate cells. And interestingly, there's one particular clone that also highlights the amastigotes in leishmaniasis. But back to the Langerhan cells, these are cells that have a uh, kind of bent or reniform nucleus. So the nucleus is kind of shaped like a kidney. Sometimes I think about a coffee bean. And it turns out there's actually a reniform nematode as well that likes to, looks like it burrows itself into the roots of, of uh, uh, somewhat of a reniform shaped sweet potato here. Immunostains for epithelium are largely keratin markers, and in order to maximize sensitivity without compromising specificity, uh, the keratins are often combined into cocktails. So uh, overall, probably the um, AE1, AE3 cocktail, which combines both high and low molecular weight 
cytokeratins is probably the one that we go to most often, although cytokeratin HMW and also MNF116 uh, are often good screening for carcinoma as well. And then other uh, type number specific cytokeratins have more specific applications that we'll take a look at. So uh, we can use carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA, to highlight sweat ducts. Uh, we can use adipophilin or EMA, epithelial membrane antigen, to highlight sebaceous glands. And then uh, cytokeratin 7 or the kind of mini cocktail CAM, CAM 5.2, which contains cytokeratin 7 and 8, uh, can highlight specifically sweat glands. So these are all markers that can be used to screen for adenocarcinoma or gland forming carcinomas. Here's a beautiful looking EMA stain highlighting the well differentiated sebocytes of a normal sebaceous gland. Bear EP4, also known as epithelial antigen. So that's kind of confusing. It's different from EMA. This is epithelial antigen. We refer to it as Bear EP4 or Bear EP4. It's an anti epithelial cell adhesion mo molecule antibody, and it's particularly useful in derm path because it's positive in basal cell carcinoma and negative in squamous cell carcinoma. So this is just control tissue here. Um, but you can see, you could probably recognize the clefting here between the tumor and the stroma, so it's good for a BCC. But this membrane staining pattern is typical for the immunopositivity of Bare EP4 in basal cell carcinoma. Of course, a comprehensive review of all the CD cluster designation immunostains is going to be impossible, um, but we'll just look at some of the highlights. So. Um, the low numbers, CD2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, these are um, typically T cell markers. Some of them are pan T cell markers, others are more specific. Here's an example of a, a CD4 stain performed on lymphoid tissue. And so we can see that most of the lymphoid follicles are negative. Certainly the uh, mantle zones are negative, but you can see there are some scattered T cells in the uh, follicle center. And so we know there are follicular T helper cells, uh, but most of the cells are interfollicular. And the list goes on. NK and TNK lymphomas are rare, but they do occur in the skin. There's a variety of markers for these cells. One of them is CD56, or neural cell adhesion molecule. It normally highlights nerve fibers in normal skin. Uh, then also various um, uh, components of cytotoxic T cells and NK cells such as TIA1, perfin, and granzyme can be used. And at this point, I expect you would be having some information overload on stains. These are just a bunch of lists at this point. So I'll refer you to pathologyoutlines.com, which is a nice free online resource for um, special stains. It's got all the CD markers and all the different stains, very well referenced, uh, no conflicts of interest. Let's take a look at some B cell markers. This is a short list. So CD20, also CD79A or CD79 alpha, and PAX5 can be used as pan B cell markers. Here is a CD20 on lymphoid tissue, and we can see that the staining is centered around the lymphoid follicles, both the follicle centers and the mantle zones, as well as a little bit of marginal zone peripheral to the mantle zone. But the interfollicular areas where we saw all those uh, CD4 positive T cells is relatively spared. And of course, the B cell list goes on and on as well. So again, pathologyoutlines.com. But a couple of notes here. Uh, for B cell proliferations that have plasma cells or plasmacytic differentiation, we can use kappa and lambda immunostains to try to determine light chain restriction, which is a marker of clonality, which in turn is a hallmark of malignancy. And so this is one of the um, rare examples where you can use immunostains to establish a diagnosis of lymphoma. And for derm path, it's most commonly in primary cutaneous marginal zone B cell lymphoma that will apply these kappa and lambda stains. Uh, and then one other note about CD20, it is a reliable pan B cell marker, but it is negative in uh, fully differentiated plasma cells and also may be negative if the treat patient has been treated previously with anti-20 therapy rituximab.
And then lastly, plasma cells uh, are chock full of immunoglobulin. So it's the same protein that is being used as the primary and secondary antibody in immunoperoxidase stain. So if you see nonspecific staining in cells that morphologically look like plasma cells, probably nonspecific. CD30, also known as K1, is considered a, a lymphocyte activation marker. So it can be present in B or T cells, but its primary role in dermatopathology is on the T cell side, primary cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders. That includes at one end of the spectrum, lymphomatoid papulosis, and the other end, primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, ALCL. Now, CD30 can also be present in uh, relatively lower numbers, but still increased in reactive processes such as insect bites and scabies. So some caution is warranted here in the interpretation. But separate from that, the staining pattern is distinctive. We want to see positivity in relatively large lymphocytes, usually with prominent nucleoli, and um, the typical membrane and paranuclear dot staining pattern is characteristic for CD30. Commonly employed macrophage markers include CD68 and CD163. CD163 is regarded as the more specific of the two, but um, in these side-by-side -side stains of lymphoid tissue, we can see that the tangible body macrophages in the follicle center are highlighted, I would submit comparably, and I, I would challenge you to tell me which is which. Usually the first thing that a trainee will learn about CD34 is that that's the marker that you need to do to confirm dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, and that's true. But it turns out that CD34 does wear a lot of different hats in the world of pathology. Uh, for dermatopathologists, uh, there's a variety, a whole differential diagnosis of CD34 positive spindle cell tumors that we'll talk about in that lecture but it's also a marker for immature hematopoietic cells, so myeloid leukemias. It's also a vascular marker for blood vessels, as well as dermal spindle cells, presumably dermal dendritic cells. So the immunostain shown here is normal skin. Because DFSP frequently enters the differential diagnosis for the far more commonly encountered and benign dermatofibroma, we often think about Factor 13A is a marker for dermatofibroma and CD34 for DFSP. CD34 is good for blood vessels. CD31 is a bit more sensitive because it highlights both blood and lymphatic channels. D240 is a lymphatic specific marker and Wilms Tumor 1, WT1, is a marker that can be used to identify vascular neoplasms because they tend to be negative in congenital vascular malformations. Muscle fibers, as well as tumors exhibiting myoid differentiation, can be identified by one or more myoid markers. In dermatopathology, we mostly use SMA, smooth muscle actin, since most cutaneous myoid tumors are smooth muscle derived. But for poorly differentiated tumors, we'll often require Desmond positivity in order to consider a leiomyosarcoma. SMA can also be used as a vascular marker for well differentiated blood vessels because SMA is positive in the pericytes. These are periendothelial cells that um, are modified myofibroblasts. With the exception of the direct immunofluorescence testing, the vast majority of immunohistochemistry is for skin tumors. So now let's take a look at patterns of inflammatory skin disorders and pretend that we don't have or pretend that we don't need immunostains at all. I don't think many of my colleagues would disagree with me if I said that the late A. Bernard Ackerman was the single greatest proponent of histologic diagnosis of inflammatory skin diseases by a pattern analysis method. In fact, many would say that he is the single greatest h and &E dermatopathology in the history of the subspecialty. In 1978, in his legendary Gold Book, he delineated the nine fundamental patterns of inflammatory skin disease. Half a century later, the topics have largely remained the same. I've been teaching Dermpath for about 20 of those years, and um, there's been only minimal reshuffling of the topics. So our curriculum now includes 10 patterns of inflammatory skin disease. 
I covered two of the topics in my last session of the previous academic year. One of those was perivascular dermatitis with minimal or absent epidermal changes. And uh, from a learning point of view, it's, it's good to look at that one last, um, but for just looking at inflammation in the skin, we can again see that the least common denominator for inflammation in the skin is perivascular inflammation. So we have dermal vessels in the upper dermis, also known as the papillary dermis and also the mid and deep uh, reticular dermis. And the inflammation comes from these blood vessels. So the, the least common denominator for inflammation in the skin is a perivascular dermatitis. All of the other topics that we're going to cover throughout the year and which we'll look at briefly from a pattern perspective right now stem from additional changes beyond just perivascular inflammation. The first three topics we covered in the previous session, spongiotic dermatitis, psoriasiform dermatitis, prototype psoriasis, and interface dermatitis, prototype lichen planus. But here we can start to split a little bit. So lichenoid is one subset of interface dermatitis. It refers to more the dense band-like infiltrate that's characteristic of many disorders that are clinically and or histologically lichenoid. The other side of interface dermatitis is a more sparsely inflammatory reaction, and it was um, designated by Ackerman as a vacuolar interface dermatitis because uh, there are vacuoles along the junction along with necrotic keratinocytes or dead reds, but overall the inflammation is sparser. It's not a dense band like we see in the lichenoid infiltrates. I just described perivascular dermatitis with minimal or absent epidermal changes. The reactions can still be quite dramatic, as in this case of a bullous arthropod bite reaction. Vasculitis also has a perivascular pattern, but we additionally need to see evidence of vascular damage, fibrin, extravasated erythrocytes, nuclear dust, usually with neutrophils. Granulomatous dermatitis seems to be the category that most are using these days for what Ackerman had originally classified as nodular and diffuse dermatitis. Uh, granulomas are nodular aggregates of predominantly histiocytes. This is a palisaded granuloma of granuloma annulare. Uh, infection is a major consideration with granulomatous dermatitis, and we have that separated out as a separate lecture. So this is like non-infectious granulomatous dermatitis. Blistering disorders can be intraepidermal or subepidermal as shown here, and the mechanism of the split can vary depending on the disease process. Folliculitis is characterized by inflammation within or around hair follicles, which are often distorted or ruptured. And these histologic features are central in the uh, inflammatory or cicatricial scarring primary alopecias. Fibrosing and sclerosing disorders are characterized by increased collagen, usually in the dermis. And finally, paniculitis, the so-called ugly duckling of inflammatory dermatopathology. These are traditionally subdivided into predominantly septal or lobular patterns of inflammatory infiltrate. So that concludes the review of special stains and patterns of inflammatory skin disease. We'll be practicing judging some of the patterns in the interactive session that follows. And my first bit of advice would be that uh, it can be intimidating when you first look at a slide and you see you know, what looks like a mess of inflammatory cells. Um, often what the trainees will say, oh, I see perivascular dermatitis or perivascular lymphocytes. And I would, I would encourage you to resist the reflexive answer of perivascular dermatitis and think, of the 10 patterns, what, what is the pattern? That's usually the first best answer to the question. So of course, perivascular dermatitis is one of the answers, but I would only pick that answer if you see nothing else. If there's more going on, then that's probably not the answer. And if you can get, you know, think of it as like a 10 part multiple choice question. And if you get that first one right, and then after that, all you have to know is one or a few disorders that fall under that pattern, and you're probably well on your way.